Okay, so let's start. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcin Velgus. Seven years ago, I joined Google, and since more than two and a half years, I have been working on the Kubernetes project. <sighs> Google is an engineering-driven company, or at least tries hard to be such. And engineers, including me, are often lazy and hate repetitive, boring tasks like manual maintenance of their applications. Moreover, with large-scale large application, manual tasks are often impossible to do, like managing thousands of services that handle search queries or show these stupid cat videos on YouTube. It would require an army of DevOps uh, people, and still it would, the results would be uncertain. So, over these years, Google built an internal system called Borg that manages the containerized application so that the engineers can slack off and enjoy legendary free food instead of worrying about the deployments, at least in theory. Based on uh, the experience with Borg about three years ago, a small group of Google, Red Hat, and Coros engineers started a project to bring Google-style container management infrastructure to the outside world. But what exactly are these software containers? How many of you have used Docker? Please raise your hand. OK, almost all, but a few of you didn't raise their hand. So uh, for those who didn't raise their hand, there is a super quick explanation. Probably everyone here is somehow familiar with the concept of a virtual machine. Simplifying a lot, virtual machine consists of operating system, application, and a bunch of uh, libraries and uh, dependencies. It runs under some other operating system. VM provides an isolation. The application running in one VM uh, interferes neither with the other apps or the hosting system, at least in theory. It is usually quite easy to take a VM from one machine and run it elsewhere. So, in principle, VMs are super useful for building and releasing software. The ability to move VMs from one place to the other often results in having a couple of them sitting on a single machine. Quite often, the hosting machine runs the exactly same operating system as you have in VMs. So there is Linux inside, Linux outside, repeated multiple times. And the resources are wasted. If we cut off this extra OS from VMs while maintaining the decent level of isolation, and high movability of the thing, we get a software containers. Software containers are meant uh, to be lightweight and easy to use. And this lightweight, lightweightness invites engineers to have many of them, especially when developing microservices. As many con uh, containers require many machines. With more than a handful of machines in different sizes and different shapes, one click quickly loses any desire to manage the whole thing manually. And for uh, that, some system is needed. Like Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized application. It's 100% open source. And when we uh, say open source, we really mean so. With the release of 1.0, we donated the whole uh, source code of Kubernetes to a newly created cloud native uh, computing foundation so that Google doesn't own this system. Uh, it cannot close it, and it is a joint effort between all of the uh, people involved. It runs on cloud as well as bare metal. It supports Docker, Rocket from CoreOS, and other container runtimes. OK, let's take a look on Kubernetes details. A pod is a main building block of the Kubernetes environment. A pod is a set of containers that should be run together on the same machine. Containers have the same IP address and can easily communicate with each other via the local host. They share volume so that the data produced by one container can be easily consumed by the other. One of the key parts of reducing maintenance cost of an application is a detailed application specification. Pod API is meant to allow an application developer to express all aspects of pod lifecycle in a declarative way that is understandable both to humans 
and container management system. From the high level, it is divided into two parts. The first part describes what containers should be run within the pod. It defines, it defines the image to execute, the CPU and memory requirements for each of the containers, as well as, uh, as well as the list of volumes that should be mounted there. The second part covers things like node preferences, information about friends and foes, how to, uh, and how important the pod is. Large part of this information is used to automatically determine which machine should, uh, in the cluster should run the pod. Kubernetes stores information about the capacity and capabilities of each of the machines and uh, the list of pods that are run on each of them. As I said a minute ago, containers declare how much resources they need in terms of CPU, memory, maybe GPUs, and the sum of all container requests is calculated to get the total needs of a pod. For example, on this diagram, uh, a small, uh, this pod on the right, left hand side has small requirements. It can fit into the second or to the third uh, node. However, a bigger pod has less nodes to choose from. This one can only go to the third node. Scheduler won't put it on the second node, and if the user try to somehow manually place the pod there, it would be rejected by the node management agent called Kublet. Some pods have more sophisticated requirements. They may want to run on specific type of nodes. For example, nodes with SSDs instead of regular hard drives or attached to a better network or on nodes that are pre-allocated for them. Kubernetes user may assign labels to nodes and later consume them in pods via a node selector. On this picture, uh, we have a node which is labeled as green and a pod that wants to run on a green node so that the green pod will go only to a node that is marked in green. And if you don't specify any label selector, a pod can go to both green or maybe yellow or some other node. <coughs> Some nodes can be really special in terms of capabilities or maybe price. Nodes with GPUs on AWS or Google Cloud Platform are a couple times more expensive than nodes without GPUs. So as a cluster administrator, you may want to put a kind of gatekeeper in front of them so that only pods that are really, really meant to be run on these nodes are scheduled there. Appropriately configured things make nodes unschedulable for pods that don't, ex, uh, don't have an explicit toleration for these things. Some pods uh, like each other so much that they should be placed on the same machines if possible. We call it pod affinity. For example, a web serving application might benefit from being close to the distributed cache instance. Sometimes the situation is opposite. Pods shouldn't be placed together. It might be not the best idea to place two super I.O. heavy uh, applications on a single node or have a couple of instances of the same super mission critical server running on a single node. What if all of the nodes uh, are already occupied and you want to start a new instance of uh, the super hyper mission critical application? Well, there are priorities. With the information about how important each pod is, the scheduler can find a node running low priority pods, remove them, and make space for this superstar pod. As you can see, pod specification uh, gives quite a lot of flexibility. It allows engineers to express the needs of the application in the terms they understand. CPU, memory, friends, foes, node preferences, they don't need to do extensive planning or manually find machines for the new shiny microservice. It will be done for them automatically. They just send the pod definition to the system. And Kubernetes will automatically figure out what to do and what actions need to be play, uh, taken in order to run this pod on the uh, node that matches the pod needs. Okay. But what if the cluster is simply full? In Kubernetes, there is an add-on component that we call Cluster Autoscaler. Cluster Autoscaler monitors the pods that failed to schedule 
And once it finds such a pod, it checks if adding a new node similar to the nodes that are already present in the cluster would help. It simulates the scheduler. And if the scheduler would place the pod on the node, should it be there, it calls the cloud, cloud provider API and simply buys you the mentioned node. And minutes later, when the node is up and running, the pod is placed and started on it. On the other hand, if there are too much resources in the cluster, and moving some stuff around would free the resources, the appropriate actions are taken by the cluster autoscaler to restart the pods on some other nodes so that the unneeded capacity is deleted and the monthly bills are lowered. On the picture, you can see that moving the uh, pod from third node to the uh, second node would free uh, the third node and it would be okay to remove it. The node is removed and now the cluster is smaller. It has all of uh, the pods that you had before, but now you pay for two nodes instead of three. If you run on one of the popular clouds, Cluster Autoscaler allows you to worry less about infrastructure and capacity planning. If Cluster Autoscaler finds that your cluster is too small uh, to run all of the pods, it will scale it up. And if you have too much resources, it will try to scale it down automatically. So there is a way to pod exactly where they want. There is an infrastructure that automatically adjusts to the pod's needs. What about application? How to manage multiple instances of pods? Well, for application, there is a concept called replica set and deployment, which I will describe in a moment. Replica set makes sure that you have exactly n instances of your pod up and running, like free Nginx servers. It creates the pod based on the user provided template and allows the scheduler to place them in the best locations. Just like here, the user asks for free pods and replica set created these three pods, so these three almost identical pods. The scheduler put them on the appropriate nodes and everyone is happy. But sometimes uh, something bad may happen to the pod. For example, the machine it was running on crashes. In such a case, replica set recreates the pod and scheduler uh, is likely to put this pod on some other node, like here. Hopefully there is still some free capacity in the cluster, but if there is no, cluster autoscaler, if enabled of course, comes into play and makes sure that the pod gets the place to live. Or the priority and preemption mechanism comes into play and some of the low priority pods are killed and the space is created. Deployment that is built on top of replica set gives you other nice features rolling update and revision control. Usually you don't want to update all of your replicas at once, but slowly uh, update them one by one. So you want to wait until the first updated replica boots up and when it's up and running, and then you start and proceed with the, uh, start the next update and proceed to the second and to the third node. Okay. So we have our end pods up and running. But what is the right value for n? In the previous example, we had three replicas. But why three? Because some app developer said that three would be OK? Come on, application developers cannot be trusted. They probably just handpicked the number and claimed they did some performance tests. And even if they did this performance test, the real-world traffic might be completely different. It might be bigger, smaller, or have completely different characteristics. So there is a need for a mechanism that will automatically adjust the number of replicas to the load in the application. And for that purpose, there is horizontal pod autoscaler in Kubernetes. For example, here we have four replicas that are burning uh, their CPUs. They run uh, about 90-95% on of the requested CPU capacity. And if any spike uh, comes, this whole thing will simply collapse and crash. So there is a clear note for yet another replica. And when this new replica is added, the traffic will uh, go down on average on each of the nodes. 
On the other hand, if our deployment is having some slower time and the, uh, the load is small, then maybe removing one of the replicas wouldn't be a bad idea. Then the load of the other replicas will go slightly up, but your cluster will have more free resources that can be used by uh, either other application or might be collected by cluster autoscaler, so you don't pay for resources that you don't need. And obviously, cluster autoscaler priority uh, preemption mechanism also helps if a sudden spike in traffic drives the number of pods outside of your cluster capacity. In general, you probably want to establish a target for a target load for your deployment. If the average load goes above the target, the new, new, the new instances are added. And if it goes below the uh, target, instances are removed. In our example, we use CP load uh, measured on the system side as a metric for scaling. However, the same operations model can be used with other metrics, like, for example, the number of requests per second uh, that is exported by the application itself. With horizontal pod autoscaler, you get more peace of mind. If for some reason the traffic uh, to your application uh, goes up, the system will react accordingly. Engineers will still need to run their performance tests. HPA uh, horizontal pod autoscaler is not a silver bullet against all performance problems and bottlenecks, but it may save uh, your evening when your uh, continuous integration slash continuous delivery pipeline pushes a version that has, let's say, 25% of performance degradation. And who needs more replicas? Moments ago, I claimed that developers usually have absolutely no idea how many replicas they need. What about the resources? Can they reliably estimate how much resources they really need? Well, the answer is no. For that reason, some time ago, we started a sub-project that will automatically adjust pot resource requests based on the current and historical needs. Vertical pot autoscaler hasn't been launched yet, but hopefully sometime in Q1 next year, we'll have a component that solves the resource estimation problem. Okay, so we have enough pods in the right version running on the appropriate machines. What else uh, need to be done? Well, the application is not guaranteed to always be in a good shape. Due to programmer errors, it might hang in some, time, in some corner cases, in such situation, a short-term solution would be simply restarting the application, hoping that it will run uh, for some time before it crashes again. As a DevOps or on-call person, you don't want to be called in the middle of the night to just restart your pod. You want the system to do it automatically for you. And for that specific reason, we have probes that can be defined on pods. There are two types of probes in Kubernetes. The first one is liveness probe. It checks if the container is working properly. And if this probe fails, the container uh, that failed this probe is restarted. The other probe is readiness probe. It checks if the containers are ready to serve the traffic. And if uh, the pod hasn't been yet fully initialized, the traffic is not sent uh, to your pod. With these two mechanisms, you can have uh, some type of guarantee that your deployment is healthy and your requested are, requests are appropriately handled. With props, you can have less on-call alerts, so it's a good habit to define them for all pods that you run. You may even go to extreme and require them from all user-facing pods. Kubernetes allows you to expand the admission checklist that is validated whenever someone issues a new request to Kubernetes so that you can plug in your own stuff there. For example, that will do this probes checking and will reject pods that are run in production that don't have probes defined. Or you may reject pods that have uh, images uh, coming from unknown source. Or you may execute some custom initialization when you, for example, create a service. The possibilities are huge, and they allow you to proactively avoid problems. In a similar fashion, you can get storage for your application. 
Kubernetes may automatically fulfill claims for persistent storage and automatically adjust the new, uh, attach the newly uh, created storage to your application. In some environments, like Google Container Engine, you can also specify auto-upgrade and auto-repair policies for your nodes, so that you always have the newest stable version of Kubernetes running, running on your nodes or master. And if, for example, the uh, Docker daemon breaks permanently on the node, this node will be automatically recreated. All the capabilities I described during the last more or less 30 minutes allow more seamless deployment, more robust infrastructure, less alerts, less production issues. It moves the, respo uh, they move the responsibility of keeping the application up and running from system administrator towards development. The, by simplifying stuff, by allowing them to specify what they exactly want to achieve with the application, and by building trust into automation uh, that can handle the regular operations for them. Restarts, resizes, uh, and simple adjustment don't need humans. Humans are better utilized when building the software itself or defining policies how to run the software. And I see this approach as the future of DevOps. More dev, left ops. Thank you. <laughs> if you learn, uh, want to learn more about Kubernetes, please visit kubernetes.io or catch me during lunch or one of these open sessions. What? Sir? What? Yeah, during lunch or open sessions. You can catch me. Oh. Okay. Hey.